All right, so hi, my name's Andy Jordan. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I'm co-presenting with this awesome guy here, Justin Grote. Uh, I work for Microsoft, and for the last few years, I've been maintaining the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code. Um, we've given a number of talks on this, a lot of it covering like the recent stuff, and today we really wanted to go over like a brief history and overview of what's almost nine years of this extension's lifespan. And I'm gonna guess it's the big green button. No, it's not. Is it this other green button? Yes, it is, yay. All right, so yeah, what's happened in like nine years to this extension? Um, well, back in like October 2015, we were just wrapping up porting PowerShell over to Linux and Mac OS. I was not quite on the team, but working with the PowerShell team at the time to do that. Um, and my buddy Sergey sets up David Wilson to start writing an extension for VS Code. It was one of the very first things. And we actually had the first commit of v0.1-preview um, back in October. The fifth update to uh, the extension at that time actually brought it to use the VS Code 0.10 APIs. Um, remember that number. These, these kind of blow up in, over the next almost decade. We've come a really long way from here. About a year and a half later from that, the version one of the extension was released. And it had most of the features, if you use the extension in VS Code, um, that you know today, like syntax highlighting, debugging, script analysis, formatting, code lenses, the extension terminal, $PS editor scripting, and more. And a lot of that's because it's sort of just leveraging other technologies and tying it all together. Um, like script analysis and formatting is just PS script analyzer, right? And debugging is built into PowerShell. It's just kind of hooking things up. Uh, so we fast forward a couple years to like January 2018, and David passes his role as maintainer over to a very friendly guy named Tyler Leonhardt. You probably have met him if you've been to these conferences in the past. Um, David's cool. He really likes editors. He went over to work on a different editor called Adam at GitHub, and last I checked, he's back at Microsoft working in Azure. Um, about a month after Tyler took over, the extension hit v1.6, so it's still going on. Uh, and what I really like to call out here is later that year, around August, uh, we had this other awesome person, Patrick Meineke, and you should remember that name. Um, he adds PS read line support, uh, which actually kind of makes this a real terminal. And this was PR number 672 to PowerShell editor services. This was huge for the extension, um, but it was really difficult to implement, which we talked about at PS Confi U two years ago now, I think. Uh, if you have questions, it's so interesting. Hit me up after this. But what it brought was like syntax highlighting in the terminal itself there in VS Code, your searchable history and multi-line editing, customizable key bindings, things you know you love in PS Read Line and had in regular terminals and simply didn't have in the extension just yet. Um, but hey, we brought it in. Well, Patrick brought it in, truly. Um, and then Tyler's joined by this guy, Rob Holt. They do some amazing work together. Uh, this, this amazing work was actually one of the first rewrites that PowerShell Editor Services, the kind of back end of the extension, um, it hit 2.0. It was practically rewritten from the ground up from the several years, right, three years of work that David had done. Uh, it uses the C Sharp language server protocol like library by OmniSharp. Um, this was really helpful because the authors, like Tyler and Rob at this point, no longer had to write the protocol itself that like the, at VS Code requires you to use, uh, that was abstracted away by this awesome shareable library that other people maintain, and we got to just focus on the PowerShell stuff on top of that. We also started having the PowerShell preview extension, which uh, nowadays is just called the pre-release channel in VS Code, um, and this really let people start iterating a lot faster because you guys are awesome and can test it out for us and let us know before we break all of our users. Um, uh, about three years later, I actually joined. Uh, I took over Tyler's job. He moved over to the VS Code team because he also loves editors. There's kind of a common theme here. I'm an editor lover myself. I mostly use Emacs or, you know, when I'm not working on this stuff. Um, and so I joined Rob, and we're actually in the middle of finishing another major rewrite. So PSCS had hit V2. It might be a little bit before we hit V3, though, because barely a year into this work, um, we, well, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all familiar with kind of happened, and we're all working together remotely, um, even though many of us are in Seattle. It, it was kind of a heck of a time, we all know. Uh, so shortly after that, like Rob showed me the ropes around and he went to go work elsewhere and I really needed some help. Like now I'm the only maintainer on this. Uh, things have kind of gone a little crazy in the world, but fortunately that guy who brought PS Readline into the extension actually officially joined me. He was a community contributor. He now works at Microsoft on the PowerShell team. Um, and 
actually he's still with us today. So Patrick, together with Sydney Smith, whose talk you should see later as our program manager, we're still your team at Microsoft trying to make this thing super awesome. Um, and that kind of leads us to all of the work that I know about now that I'm the maintainer of the extension. So we spent a year and a half uh, and so many pre-releases, I couldn't even count them in the changelog, um, finishing that threading rewrite from Rob. So we're, we had rewrite of PSCS to V2, now we're working on PSCS V3, and that actually got released to everyone back in like uh, 2022 um, in May. And <laughs> well, you know, it was awesome that we did the rewrite, but as you just saw, like that was a lot of years, a lot of maintainers, a lot of community contributors, um, and we really loved those community contributions, but there'd been a big focus on features, experiments within the extension, like for a while, uh, notebooks, like VS Code notebooks, were actually baked into the extension itself before it was a feature in VS Code. Um, and th this kind of stuff was like implemented, not super tested, it was great, people liked it, but it was sort of broken, and we really just needed to give the extension some TLC. So for the last couple years now, uh, we've been just working on quality. Uh, in fact, like some of these things got removed because they were moved upstream. So notebooks aren't part of the extension, it's deleted. You can still use notebooks because that work that Tyler continued when he moved over to the VS Code team exists in VS Code itself. Um, but just kind of like an overview of some of these things that we fixed over the last couple of years after hitting V3, uh, and we've not hit V4, we're sticking with V3 because it's all about quality now. Like, how many of you remember the typewriter effect if you were using the extension terminal on specifically Mac OS? You'd paste something in and you'd literally watch it character by character by character. Uh, it, it looked like an old school typewriter. Uh, that was due to the implementation of PS Readline and just kind of technical requirements of how C Sharp worked. Uh, we managed to find a way around it. Again, ask me later, it was super cool. Um, uh, but we also fixed like completions not appearing if you typed too quickly. We had a couple like race conditions happening. We needed to cancel requests properly. Now you generally, from as far as I know, I hope this is happening, get your completions no matter how quickly you type. Um, we also, in that V3, we, we broke supporting other editors. Like yes, Microsoft makes VS Code, but kind of the whole point of VS Code was this uh, overarching protocol called the language server protocol where people could make servers, LSP servers, or it's called PowerShell editor services um, that support all of your editors. You, you write your features in a server and you hook up the client, your editor, VS Code, Atom, Vim, Emacs, whatever you want, and they just talk to each other over the protocol. Well, ours was kind of just working with VS Code because you know we, that was what we were testing on. And we had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what was wrong with that. Uh, it turned out to be some issues over like how we handled standard IO uh, since VS Code used name pipes and we'd forgotten about standard IO. Um, but you know what we did as we fixed these things? We wrote regression tests. So many regression tests that my head still spins. We actually have like full tests that spin up PowerShell editor services with Vim and with Emacs with like a default configuration and checks that not only has it connected, that with an open PowerShell script, all the features are working as you would expect. So like it, it checks if a PowerShell script analyzer is showing you the warning that we would expect in that script. So we won't break other editors again. We do love more editors than just VS Code, although uh, later in, in just a few minutes here, you're gonna get to see some really cool features in VS Code. Um, but yeah, we just we kept on working on fixing things. Uh, you couldn't debug untitled scripts for a long time. Uh, that was, you know, an often requested feature. It did work, and then we broke it. You just, you know, you open a new tab in VS Code. You've got some PowerShell code in it. You should be able to debug it. Like, why force somebody to save this script? Um, so we fixed that. There used to be a lot of ghost extension terminals, especially like when you would restart the session. Oh gosh, the amount of work we had to put in to make the startup and shutdown process of the extension like idempotent, like that it could keep track of the stuff that had opened and close it properly. That's mostly fixed. Um, there was the little spinner icon <laughs> that got lost in the third rewrite. We brought that back. We had a huge symbol overhaul, which was actually a collaborative feature with uh, Frode Flatten. Is that his last name? Yeah, Frode. Yeah. Frode. Um, that was that was awesome. We now support classes in. Uh, like if you have your class in your PowerShell code, we support that as proper symbols and symbols are fast now. Um, and like small things though, but you know, if you set your additional PowerShell executables path, like, hey, go find this PowerShell that I downloaded from GitHub, um, or you set your current working directory in the settings, well, for a long time, it only worked with absolute paths. But there's this great thing that VS Code does where it syncs your settings to your other machines. 
your absolute path isn't going to work from one machine to another. And as simple as it seems on like the surface to support tilde and like uh, you know dot slash just relative directories, it was quite a bit of work to make it work consistently underneath the covers. Um, but yeah, we just kept focusing on quality, and that actually brings us to today the four thousand eight hundred and sixtieth pull request to the extension repository because it's been again almost a decade. Uh, brought it up to VS Code v1.82 APIs. And remember, we started with 0.1. Uh, oftentimes, people are like, hey, why is it so hard to adopt this new feature in VS Code or some question like that, right? Um, it's so much easier if you're writing a new extension against the latest APIs to make something work. But when you have something that you know was written against the 0.1 APIs 10 years ago, actually fast forwarding up to v1.82, is a lot harder than writing it from scratch because you have to keep things working. It all, it all interacts with the rest of the extension. Um, and we've gone through quite a few thousand pull requests. So yeah, we're at eight and a half years later. As of yesterday, the version 2024.2.0 stable uh, ex version of the extension was released. Just push that out. That has actually enhanced terminal shell integration support. Um, one of the cool features within VS Code is those little, like if you're in the terminal in the bottom, it puts glyphs on the side, it, it tracks if your command was successful or not successful, and lets you like scroll back between commands. When that first got implemented, we kind of had to copy their script from within the VS Code repository, paste it over to PowerShell editor services, tweak it to work properly, and then we just kept having to do that over and over every time they would update it. And the last time that this happened, I had to sit down and be like, no, there has to be a way we can just use their built-in script uh, and ask me for more of the details afterwards, but that's actually working now. Um, we just automatically use their latest script. It should just work as soon as they've put new features in it. Uh, and yeah, since we're running short on time, I'm just gonna pass this right on over to Justin here for some awesome VS Code demos, and we'll take whatever questions you have either at the end of this if we've got time or find me in the hallway. All right, thanks so much, Andy. I really appreciate it. And again, like big round of applause. That one was fantastic because uh... <laughs> This is what happens behind the scenes with this extension, and like a lot of times you don't see it, but the wonderful thing is it's all done in the open, so you can just you can see everything that's happened because it's all on GitHub. Every commit, every discussion, every argument that we've had, everything that like, oh, we wanna do this, is like, okay. Every, every time I've been like, why can't we just do this nice thing? I'm like, okay, I get it. It makes more sense why we can't do this. And um, also another thing, big, uh, another big hand for Patrick, who also, for some of you who don't know Patrick's name specifically, you may know Seemingly Science. So if you're on the Discord, if you're on Twitter, how many people here have like ever had seen Seemingly Science or had him like help you with something? Yeah, he is amazing. Like, I don't know where he gets the time to do all the community contributions. He, he's, he's my go-to. I mean, I'm, I'm like, help me, Patrick. I don't know how any of this works. Please help me out. So yeah, uh, again, yeah. That's the one of the wonderful things about this extension is the community that's around it. And one of my favorite things about just the VS Code philosophy in general is to me like VS Code in its own way adopts the PowerShell sacred vow. Like VS Code builds this environment where if you take the time to learn VS Code, it will be one of the greatest investments you make in your career. Because everything that works in VS Code with the wonderful extension ecosystem and everything um, is built around these standardizations so that when you learn how to debug in PowerShell, like it takes you forever, but if you ever get to the point that, hey, maybe you wanna try TypeScript or maybe you wanna try C Sharp, when you start debugging, it, the interface is the same. Like the way that you get to variables is the same. They're gonna be more language specific based on like how that language server that uh, Andy talked about works, but you have this place where you're able to get that value. So I love working with the VS Code um, team and on the extensions, and again, I'm. I'm, I'm just a contributor, I'm just anybody out on GitHub, just anybody can do what I'm doing. We're just on issues, trying to help figure out where the issue is and help them take the load off people like Andy and such so that they can focus on doing the stuff they do, which is be absolutely brilliant at C-sharp and TypeScript to implement these things. Um, you know, but even just somebody just in the issues, just being like, help somebody troubleshoot an issue and determine, is it a real issue? Or even you, if it's not a real issue, you help them out. And if, it's not, if it is a real issue, then we can get it fixed. So I was just gonna show a few things today that um, because of that investment and because you're in the VS Code ecosystem, these are some things that have been added to VS Code in the last year that uh, aren't in the PowerShell extension. Because even though like it's been a maintenance release mostly for the PowerShell extension this year, you're still getting more and more value in the VS Code extension just by simply having it be part of the VS Code ecosystem. So one of the first things I wanna show here is this one particular issue right here. I wanna really zoom in on one aspect here. If you look at this, Starting down here, look at this. 
2,882, 40, et cetera. And we go up here a little bit higher. Uh, started August 4th, 2016. So for what, nine years or eight years until it came out, this was the most requested VS Code issue for eight years running. And there were some aspects about the way that the extension worked that made it very, very hard to do. But now you can do this. If you have not seen this, I have my VS Code window here. And if I have a tab, I can drag it and I can make a new window. That is huge. If you use multiple monitors, I mean, that's fucking incredible. Excuse me. That's very. I don't care if you bleep that out or not, because it, it really matters. Like, if you work in any kind of multiple monitor environment, you felt the pain of your editor being like jailed to one monitor. Being able to do this and do that kind of thing is really great. And, but the way that they've implemented this has been so flexible now is that you can take a terminal and I can put it up here. You probably already knew you could do this. You can put, take your terminals and treat them just like editors. If, it, if my PowerShell extension gets out of the way, and you know, there's my terminal there. Or I can bring it over here and make it a side side thing here so I can do things and then check my code worked. But you can also now bring it out here. So you can have almost like a Windows terminal kind of deal here, but it's still your VS Code. And this is all flexible and building the same thing. So I can bring this guy down here. I can bring all this and bring it back in over here. You have all that kind of flexibility now with the editing. And like, there's nothing we had to do to make that work in the PowerShell extension because it's part of the VS Code ecosystem. It just works. And all that stuff, like there was nothing we had to do to make that supported. <clears throat> so another thing I want to show is something that's been added that you've probably seen um, because it was enabled by default very recently is a thing called Sticky Scroll. So I'm going to go to the Module Fast module, which is this big, giant, ugly monstrosity of a thing. And you'll notice here at the top, um, it's keeping the hierarchy of where I am in my project. So even though I'm like 1,200 lines down, I know, and what's really neat about this is it supports regions, you know, it supports the class header, it supports the method here, in this case of a class that I'm doing, but if you go down to like just a, a function that I might have down here, if I can find one, you go to like a function like get module, I hop down here, but I'm still already seeing all that information on the top. So it provides you a lot of really great context. And again, uh, the fact that it works with regions, the fact that it does functions, we didn't have to write any of that because it uses that standard language server and uh, the PowerShell extension contributes and uses that interface. Making that investment makes it so that all this extra stuff that happens in VS Code, we get that stuff for free. So this is a great feature. Some people get super annoyed by that, but I get it. But again, the wonderful thing about VS Code is it's just one setting you can do to turn that off. Um, one other thing I want to show is that with um, VS Code, a thing that was added very recently is the ability to forward ports directly from VS Code built in for free. Uh, who here has used things like ngrok or that kind of thing when you're like testing a web server and you want to like see what it looks like outside or any kind of thing you want to like test that way? Anybody aware of like ngrok or that kind of thing? This gets a little more developer-y, but I'm going to kind of show an example in PowerShell where this is useful. So I have here um, Pode which uh, Pode is basically a web server that's been developed in PowerShell. Um, there's also the wonderful PowerShell Universal, which is also a very wonderful tool. And so I'm just going to start a little web server here that if you read this, again, the wonderful thing about PowerShell, it's very uh, legible. This is just going to start a web server on port 8080 that if I go to slash modules, it'll just run git module on my computer. So if I open this guy up, and I already have it kind of pre-cooked here, but if I go to localhost slash modules. Hopefully it runs reasonably quick. So there's the modules on my computer, but it automatically like took the module, took, took the output of the PowerShell command, formatted it for HTML and outputted it. You can make wonderful, powerful, really cool dashboards with this, make tools that your users can use in a web page and never even have to touch a PowerShell tool and do it all and utilize PowerShell. Really great tool. But if you want to test this or you want to give somebody else to test it or test it so that you can see what it looks like on the outside, you know, that's, if you don't, if you have a home router, maybe you know how to do port forwarding and deal with all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're in a work environment, you can go ask your firewall team. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but one thing you can do now is that in Visual Studio Code, either you can go to this ports tab and just choose forward a port, or you can simply do the magic control shift P or F1 or anything and just choose forward a port, and then put in the port you want to forward, in this case, 8080. And what happens here in this very short period there, now I have this URL, and what happened here is that the same technology that Danny was showing with like Azure Arc, there's this thing called Azure Relay under the hood that makes all that stuff work. So the same stuff powers this thing called DevTunnels, um, which has lots of different extensions, but it's also been built right into VS Code. So now that I've done this, um, any of you can just go to this address on the internet and you'll be able to see my, um, so that's the base part, if I go slash modules, 
It, you know, you can put that URL in your phone or your laptop right now and you'll be able to see that. It might give you a GitHub prompt because this is secure. It's done in a way that it requires authentication. If you don't set it up to be public, which I haven't, um, you'll see that over here it's private, but I could switch this to public and you'd be able to see that. And it's a great way to be able to very quickly forward things out. Everything goes SSL out, so it pretty much gets through most firewalls as they're set up today. And you're able to like present things and like test things and make sure that things work the way that you want to in like a real quick example. Um, so one last thing I want to show real quick, even though there's lots of stuff that was added this year, is triggered breakpoints. So this is something that was added to, again, this was added to VS Code in general, but we did not have to add anything to the debugging engine. There was no PR that had to happen in PowerShell to support this. Because VS Code uh, natively does it, um, we were able, it just came along and the PowerShell extension now works with it without us having to do anything. So what a triggered breakpoint is, I'm gonna go ahead and remove this one here, is if you have a breakpoint, um, this is a contrived example, but have you ever had something where you're trying to test a certain situation and you don't want to keep hitting like this same breakpoint over and over again? Maybe you only want to break at this point of code if this other point actually happens. So you can make sure that you're on the right happy path. So that, you know, if you're on the 99th loop, you only want to do that one. Well, there's been ways to do that before with things called conditional breakpoints, if you're not familiar with those, where you can add any kind of script block in here to match the condition to kind of filter so that you're only hitting on that one. But there are also sometimes scenarios where you want like a dependent thing. You only want to hit a breakpoint if another breakpoint was triggered first. So you can now do that. You can just click here and you just use add triggered breakpoint. And when you select that breakpoint, I can say OK and set that. And so now when I run this, I'm going to get a read host prompt that says press 1 to debug. First time I'm just going to hit 0. And did my thing not, my debug did not start. There we go. Does not like my breakpoint. Let's try this one more time with one and see if it works. Okay, so I hit the trigger, I hit this individual breakpoint, and actually, sorry, I was not paying attention to my own demo. So because I hit zero, I never hit this piece of code, but I also never hit the triggered breakpoint code, so you notice no breakpoints got hit. But this time I ran, I have now hit this breakpoint, and so now because I've hit this breakpoint and X is one, um, now I'm actually hitting this breakpoint. It only hits this breakpoint because it hit the other one. So that's a, that's a great feature, especially when you get into some more detailed debugging of PowerShell scripts. Um, but you know, the overarching like message that I want to bring is that all of these great features that come, which I highly recommend you check out one of a couple sources, because this is where I always learn where they are, is the Visual Studio release codes are fantastic. These are some of the oops, uh, um, these are some of the best release notes that I've ever seen for any product ever. And uh, we do a pretty good job with the PowerShell release notes. Well, Andy does a pretty good job with the PowerShell release notes that you can see the details here, but like they add in, like they add in videos for how things work, you know, they have all these things, details, all kinds of things of extensions, stuff that's added. This is a great thing to just look, to just see what's coming on and what's going on in the extension that's growing. So there's also this great thing done by one of the VS Code contributors named Matt. He does this thing called Code 2020, and these are just a series of YouTube shorts where just a minute, minute and a half, he shows you, hey, here's how to do a quick search, here's how to do this thing, here's how to paste his HTML. And he's called Code 2020 because that's when he started it. He's been doing them ever since. There's hundreds of these. So this is a lesson in like tips and tricks of VS Code that you can just hit just by, you know, you know, on a lunch, just hit two or three of these a day and you'll just pick up all kinds of neat tips and tricks about that. And so, and again, as Andy mentioned, um, there is a new release. I'm very proud that I have like my own one little PR in here. So I get my little fancy picture down here in the contributors. But this can be you. And it doesn't have to be, in this case, like I fixed a little debugging thing that has nothing to do with you guys, but it makes it easier for us to troubleshoot where the extension is. And if you're submitting an issue, there's now a place where we're much more likely to be able to, to see the logs and see, oh, okay, we see exactly where that problem is and not have to dig so much on our side. But um, you know, you can make PRs here, like if you just improve the documentation, if the getting started documentation about the extension, if uh, with uh, PowerShell, if you have a new window, I don't think I'll be able to do it here, but if you ever open a window for the first time, there's a, hey, welcome to uh, PowerShell. Here's a tour of the extension. And if you feel like, hey, there's actually like, I would have found it really useful if it would have a tour of this, that's just a really simple like file that you can edit and then update like what the tour looks like. And if you wanna make a PR for that, we'll help you facilitate it and merge it. So um, I'm really happy that we have this great community that works on this extension so that we get all these additional functionalities for free. The extension continues to be wonderful and stable. Bug counts are way, way down. I know like my personal experience is like I would full reload my VS Code probably like every 15 minutes, not even like you know a year and a half, two years ago. 
And thanks for the tireless work of like Patrick and Andy and such, chasing down all the bugs. That, it's not the fun stuff, you know, it's not the new feature stuff, but it makes the extension better. And it makes the extension better for all of us and makes it so that it just becomes so that much more ingrained that like, oh, now we have to have it, you know. You, you reduces your reliance on ISE, makes it so that VS Code is there. And the more you invest in VS Code, the more now you can do things in YAML, you can do things in Go, you can do things in TypeScript, and it all has this kind of familiar thing so that you're spending your time learning those new skills and not spending your time how an IDE works. So thank you guys so much very much. Um, uh, lunch is going to be ready here for a second. I imagine uh, uh, we're going to come up here and talk a little bit more about that. Um, but again, thank you so much. Actually, um, we actually have just a little bit of time. We actually, surprisingly for me especially, that we ended up under time. So we actually have some time for a little bit of Q&A. If you want to know anything about the VS Code extension, um, any issues that you've had, um, any features that you're looking at, like, hey, why doesn't it do that? Or just any questions in general? Yeah, we're here for a little bit. Also, just a huge thank you to everyone who uses that pre-release and files bug One, reports. Please keep doing it. We love it all. 100%. It's so easy to switch to the pre-release extension. You just go there and say switch to pre-release. If it breaks something, in, you can just switch it back. But if you're using the pre-release, it helps all of us so much to make sure that the wider audience that isn't as technical with VS Code, you know, can get those advantages. So, yeah. This is a frequently asked question. And so re repeat it, repeat it. Yeah. So the question is like, you open, you have the PowerShell extension installed. You open VS Code, and uh, VS Code by default it has extension terminals. For sorry, it it has terminals. Keyword is not extension. VS Code has generic terminal support, and you've probably set your default terminal to be PowerShell. And if you hit like Control J and you open the terminal pane, VS Code opens a PowerShell terminal for you, or it might be Bash or whatever you've got it set to. But when you open up a PowerShell script file um, or do anything that might trigger the PowerShell extension to activate, the back end, which is PowerShell Editor Services, uh, that is another PowerShell process that we host and connect as an extension terminal. So it's a contributed terminal to VS Code. Um, we have a way to make it so you don't see the extension terminal. Uh, honestly, if I were to go back 10 years ago, I might say that we never exposed it. However, there are a lot of benefits to it being there. You can interact with the actual like process that's running your, uh, your script analysis of the script files you have up, um, your completions. So if you're writing a custom script and you source it into that extension terminal, you can interact with it directly. It's, it's sort of not a holdover, but like something taken from the ISE where your terminal shares your editor context, right? Um, so the extension terminal sort of has to be there if you want to use that. If you don't want to hide it, you do sort of have to deal with VS Code saying, hey, you open the terminal pane, I gave you a terminal. At this point, to have it only be the extension terminal show up, it's just continuing to ask VS Code to make it so that you can not have other terminals open up because it sort of just supplies one as soon as you open the pane which happens when the extension terminal shows up. So we'd love to do it, and you can hide ours, but we haven't found a way to hide theirs just yet. Keep asking VS Code, upstream bugs. Yeah, and, and a small add that I have to that is part of the reason why that's not a thing is because the PowerShell extension is like one of the only extensions that does that. It makes it, it makes it so much more of an engineering effort just to give you that ISC experience. Like Python doesn't do that, Go doesn't do that, it all happens in the background for you. And so as a result, like nobody else has that request, so we can't get that pushed with the VS Code team. And you know, honestly, like we'd rather focus on PowerShell stuff than trying to get that little thing fixed. So and they did improve the experience a lot yes, for us. Yes. Like it is part of why you can restart the extension now. And there's the concept of we own that terminal and close it and reopen it. Um, so they have worked with us and given us some great APIs. Yeah. considered going back to Notepad++, and now it's awesome. Thank you. Yay. So glad to hear that. Thank you so much. We, we, didn't, we didn't hear All we heard was that it was awesome. I'm glad that that's the only part that's on yeah. the recording. Fixing bugs is not glamorous. Like, truly, the amount of regression tests I wrote and, like, the time invested into figuring out how to write a regression test for some of these features and bugs uh, that we squashed, it, it's... It's not that fun, unless you're a little crazy like I am, and then it's maybe a little fun. Um, but yeah, we haven't had a lot of big features in the last couple of years, but we've heard over and over that, hey, it works now and I can actually use it, and that's really what we wanted to get to as a quality extension. Yeah, like 60% of my contributions are only things that Andy sees, and he's like, thanks, that makes it easier. I'm like, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, but you guys would never see, so. Uh, the question is, do we still hear from people uh, that they want to use the ISE because it's faster? And you know, I have to honestly say, yeah, we still have people say, hey, I like the ISC and how it does this. And for when the ISC was written, it got to integrate itself 
100% perfectly with PowerShell because it was an editor written for PowerShell, whereas VS Code is an editor written for everything, and we're just adding to VS Code, and we do weird things VS Code doesn't expect, like that extension terminal, that feature that we kind of brought over from the ISE. Um, at this point, because the ISE hasn't moved to PowerShell Core, we can kind of just say, hey, if you use it and, it, and you're sticking with PowerShell 5.1 there, I'm not wrong about that, right? It's, it's just pa Windows PowerShell and the yeah, ISE. Windows yeah. PowerShell only for ISE. I don't use it. I write in VS well, Code. <laughs> with, with an aside, there are crazy people like the guy who maintains uh, PowerShell Universal, Adam. He figured out a way to get PowerShell 7 to work in ISE. Wow. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> just, it, it, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the, what, uh, uh, um, the Jurassic Park one. It's like, yeah, you spent so much time wondering if you could, you didn't think about if you should, so yeah. We've done a lot of things to make the extension faster, especially on like large workplaces where you have symbols. Um, when we like scan for symbols and scan all of your files for symbols, if it's a huge workspace, which happens if you say open your home folder and we go, oh, your workspace is your home folder and you have every single project, um, that can obviously impact performance. We have added options to say, analyze only open editors for symbols, and that can really speed up the experience. But if there's other performance bugs, please open an issue with us so we can get to the bottom of it and try to make it faster. And that's noon. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Hey, let's get a group selfie. Yeah. We got it. Group selfie. Group selfie. <laughs>